Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 5, Heredity. This is the final video, number 31, in our hereditary series, and it's on population genetics and human evolution. This time again, we're going to look at this uh, use of large-scale collaborative projects to identify links between population genetics and human evolution. What you should be able to do is discuss some of these ideas that relate to human evolution um, to link uh, I guess in a general way, some of the population genetic data to human evolution and um, more specifically to look at how we have obtained information um, from mitochondrial DNA uh, about our ancient ancestors. So this is our last look at population genetics for now, but population genetics will pop up again in um, our uh, module number six. So we will have a chance to revisit some of these concepts. And so for now, just a bit of an introduction to looking at some of these very important applications of population genetics and human evolution. And human evolution is one of these very uh, emotive and challenging studies. It's one of the things that can generate uh, quite a deal of uh, ego, uh, controversy, uh, there's obviously um, can be religious elements to it as well. Uh, and it's also um, unfortunately inspired some fraudulent activity in its history. Uh, and probably Piltdown Man is the most, um, uh, most recognisable example of that sort of a thing. Nevertheless, um, genetic and population studies, and certainly um, as we've learnt more about the human genome, we've started to unlock some of the information about human ancestry. When we're looking at genetic studies, there's a couple of areas that we can specifically track in, in terms of patterns of inheritance. The first of these is nuclear DNA. Now, nuclear DNA is the information, the DNA that's contained within the nucleus, which has come from the sperm from the male and the egg from the female. So that information um, has come from both parents. And so when we're tracking ancestry patterns, that can be tracked back through all of our ancestors are all the way back through time. On the other hand, uh, we've also realised that there's DNA contained within the mitochondria. Now, there's not very many genes in the mitochondria, um, but there are some. And because there are some, we can do the same sort of things. We can sequence that information and we can use that for profiling. We can look at comparisons um, of different individuals and see the degree of similarity um, between their mitochondrial DNA. And of course, there's an assumption that we're making here around about time, um, although I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. The important thing about mitochondrial DNA is it only comes from the female side, from the maternal side. So it's mother to daughter uh, to granddaughter and so on. This is because the um, embryo develops from the fertilized egg and in the fertilized egg, the sperm contributes really just the nuclear material, just that genetic information from its, its nucleus, which is going to bind with the information in the female egg nucleus. And that's going to um, create the blueprint for the new individual. But the egg itself has mitochondria from the mother, from the female. And so therefore, each egg that develops will have some mitochondria from the mother. And so uh, provided that the, uh, we follow the female line down, of course, if we follow the male line, the male will only contribute the, um, whilst, whilst the male will have mitochondria from their mother, it won't contribute any of that mitochondrial DNA to the fertilized egg. And so therefore, uh, we can track mitochondrial DNA from female ancestor to female ancestor all the way through. So this is what it roughly looks like. Now, there's no need to try and memorize these 37 genes or get any understanding at all really about what's going on here, except for the fact that because it's DNA, it's made up of those important four bases in particular sequences. We can sequence those. We can look for variations and we can understand that there's a relationship between time and change. 
such that we would expect that over a longer period of time we would see more change. And that's exactly what we do um, assume when we work through this. So working backwards, if we look through the maternal lines, through, through the mothers going back and back and back into history, what we have found is a, an individual who's been regarded as mitochondrial Eve. So mitochondrial Eve is the first um, the, the, the female that we can track our ancestry back to. Is she the first female? No, um, but she's the common ancestor. She's the, she's the source of that common mitochondrial DNA. Now, the reason for this is that any woman um, on the earth now that doesn't have any children or that does have children but has only um, male children will not pass on her mitochondrial DNA either. Mitochondrial DNA only gets into the subsequent generations um, through daughters. So the daughter and then the daughter having a child. And so again, that mitochondrial DNA will go through to the next generation. If she has no children, obviously that will stop. If she does have children, but they're only sons, then her genetic information will still go into the next generation through the uh, nuclear DNA, but the mitochondrial DNA will not. So this is where, if we can track back through history, there'll be lots of female dead ends, if you like, where they didn't reproduce, maybe they died young, or they didn't have daughters. Uh, so this is the one that we kind of work backwards towards as a common ancestor. Some of this has been based on a technique known as halo type, uh, haplotyping. And haplotyping, if, if you think about um, uh, a haploid cell, the haploid cell is the gamete, so it has uh, the N number of chromosomes. Um, and so it comes from the mother or the father. So this haplotyping is based on groups of alleles that are uh, inherited together, like linked genes. And so it's, it's these sort of genes that come together, such as they do in the mitochondrial DNA, that allows us to be able to track some of these ancestral patterns back through the years. Now, there's a couple of other applications as well that are interesting. Uh, one is known as the SRY gene. Now, the SRY gene is the sex-determining region of the Y chromosome. Now, we followed the female line through the mitochondrial DNA, and obviously we can't do anything like that for the male, but we do know that male are determined, the sex of males is determined by a specific gene, a specific region on the Y chromosome. And it's a, it's a region that codes for the development of testes. And uh, this gene has to actually be turned on for this to occur. But what it means is that if we can track, and this time, of course, we have to look at males, and we have to track the males back through time to see where, what's happened in this particular region of the Y chromosome. By doing a similar um, set of genetic studies to what we did with mitochondrial Eve, we've got back to a, a, um, an Adam, if you like, uh, who lived about 300,000 years ago. Now, obviously, this isn't Adam and Eve. They're about 100,000 years apart anyway. And again, it's not the first man. It's just a common ancestor that we can track back through. So this is one of the important things about our ancestral studies, about looking at, at human evolution in this sense, about trying to go back in time and see where um, each of these genes has gone and how it may have changed over time. One other interesting application that's quite relevant to us in Australia, because we have one of the most ancient uh, peoples on the planet, is the Australian Aboriginal ancestry. What um, human genome project studies have been able to do is to identify a single wave of migrants that came out of Africa around about uh, 70,000 years ago, and they made their way, they migrated through to Australia and have subsequently had a very long period of isolation. They're not recent arrivals in Australia. The Aboriginal uh, people are a very ancient people, and they've been on Australia for a v on the Australian continent for a very, very long time. In fact, there seems to be evidence from genetic studies of some quite unique adaptations in Aboriginal populations um, to survival in the arid Australian environment. So, just some of the the changes that we can see in the pattern of genes um, is. Uh, an important link with the environmental changes that had happened and that had uh, historically happened to Australia in terms of climate change uh, over the, the last 70,000 years. 
So these are some of the applications that we can look at. And obviously in class, we'll go into uh, case studies again uh, here just to look at a couple of these in a little bit more detail so that you understand how to use data uh, in order to um, um, understand what this population genetic data can tell us about not just areas about human evolution, but also diseases which we've looked at and uh, conservation management which we've looked at as well. This brings to an end our um, series on heredity and uh, so our next videos that will be set up will be for module six genetic change. Thanks for watching.